Okay, I think we're ready to get started here. Um, so welcome, thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, come to this class on plant-based nutrition and the START solution. Uh, I'm Terry Casados. I think I've seen uh, some familiar faces and names that come to our cooking classes, appreciate that. And then we've got a lot of new first timers too, so that's great. So happy to see that. Um, so yeah, I just uh, wanna thank everybody coming and. I noticed a lot of the people on the meetup group are already plant-based, currently plant-based or vegetarian or transitioning to a plant-based diet or what we like to call plant curious, which they're, they wanna learn more. So that's great too. So yeah, hopefully this class will give you that information, the knowledge that you need to go forward. If you are transitioning to a plant-based diet, this will help, I hope. And I just wanted to share all this information I've learned over the past 16 plus years from many of the experts that we know, Dr. John McDougall, Neil Bernard, Dr. Scott Stowell, uh, Alan Goldhammer, just many, many more. And plus my knowledge being a, a nutrition therapy practitioner, um, I can share the, my experiences too and knowledge of nutrition in the body. So. Uh, I know that a lot of this information may be overwhelming. It's a lot, it's an hour presentation. There's a lot of information there. It may be overwhelming, but we're gonna post this on YouTube, my YouTube channel. It's in my on my website, and I'll post it later in the chat window so you can see. If you want to look, re revisit the, the uh, class, and you know, maybe you want to pick up another topic or something like that that you didn't quite get, because there's a lot of information here. I understand that. So if you can do that, and it's why, why in this uh class with the Zoom, just keep your mics off. We'll have a Q&A afterwards uh, and I'll answer questions um, then. And you can also put those in the chat window now. Maybe I can get to them later. So they'll be you know, accumulating through the, through the class. So you can put some questions. If some little something you don't understand, I'll be glad to uh, share that with you. So we're ready to get started here. Um, and that's pretty much it. We'll just make sure we're all on the same page. And I'll, I'm gonna share my screen. We'll go through this uh, presentation. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Yeah. Okay, keep going. All righty, so this class, of course, an introduction to plant-based nutrition and the START solution, we'll get into that. And just basically how to live a healthy lifestyle and obtain optimal health through nutrition and the lifestyle. Little disclaimer here before I get started. Um, the information contained in this presentation is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. I uh, all specific medical questions should be presented to your own healthcare provider before making any changes to your diet and exercise. And be sure to consult your your physician if you do change the diet and and change and do not change any medications without professional advice. That's that's important. And a little background: who I am, uh, Jerry Casados, nutrition therapy practitioner. Uh, my, I received my diploma from Nutrition Therapy Institute here in Denver, uh, a certificate in plant-based nutrition from Cornell University and the T. Colin Campbell Foundation. And also I'm a certified instructor for Dr. John McDougall's START Solution Program, which has been scientifically proven. And based on his uh, 40 years or so of helping patients gain the lost health and appearances. And I do have a private practice and I've been, we've been, uh, Kelly and I have been plant-based for now so over 16 years. So let me uh, check something, make sure I can see, let some other people in here. Hold on, yeah, participants. Okay, I think we're good for now. Um, so anyway, I'd like to share my story, a little journey that I've been through with my own health issues and why I changed to a whole food plant-based diet um, basically, I had a heart, heart disease, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, those issues. I was on Lipitor, cholesterol med, and three other blood pressure medications. And I was asymptomatic, too. I didn't have any symptoms. I thought I was healthy. I was very active. So I, I never knew it. But there was heart disease in the family, so I was aware of that issue. 
But back in February 2007, I did some EBT heart scans, two of them, actually five years apart, and uh, hold on, uh, and showed some progression of heart disease from 2002 to 2007. And there was a cal calcification score increase from 50 to percentile range to the 75 percentile range, which isn't good because uh, artery calcification is a marker for coronary plaque in your arteries, but they can't tell you where. So that wasn't a good sign. So it's progressed over five years. And I was, you know, thought I was being healthy. I was asymptomatic, like I said, and I thought I was eating healthy, but uh, apparently I wasn't. So the doctor recommended I do a nuclear stress test uh, after the results of the scans. And that's where they shoot dye in your heart, in your veins, and they watch the blood flow going through your heart and see where there's any blockages or anything happening in the hearts. And they put you on a treadmill and test you out that way too. But the results weren't good. They showed artery calcification on my left side and it was a dark spot they saw. So uh, my physician and the cardiologist recommend I, I do an angiogram. Um, that wasn't good news. Um, so, but I declined the recommendation for the angiogram procedure, which my doctor was not too happy with. He, it was kind of, uh, try, he was really trying to pressure me to do it. But, you're probably asking why would I decline an angiogram where they saw those results? Well, the interesting thing was I, I learned something in the past from in 2002 actually about heart disease. And I was always aware of heart disease because my dad had a heart attack at 54. He survived, but his health got worse and he didn't, he died at 68. So the heart disease was the primary cause of other issues in his health through the years. Um, but I read a, I had an aha moment, if you will. When I sat in the doctor's office, he was telling me about the angiogram, and I was, of course, you know, you're, you're afraid, your your fear sets in, and you're just thinking, what what else can I do? Is there another way to to handle this? But then that not 2002, that aha moment that I had some knowledge, and knowledge is power. And so what I did, I decided on a lifestyle approach. Instead, I, I decided oatmeal versus an angiogram. So, and why I did it is because I read that in 2002, this book, Dr. John McDougall's 12 Days to Dynamic Health, I bought and I read it and I tried to make a change, never kept it up. Um, it was back in 2002, that was pretty difficult being a vegan or plant-based. There wasn't many options to do food and everything. So anyway, I gave it a shot, but I didn't, I kept it up, modified it, didn't really do it. But I was aware of the information. That's what made me talk, tell the doctor I didn't want to do the angiogram. Of course, he thought I was crazy and didn't, didn't like that at all. So what I did, I, I told him, well, I'll, I'll start this diet and lifestyle change for 30 days, and I'll come back, and <clears throat> we'll discuss the angiogram, see if anything's uh, improved. Uh, and, he went, and he said, okay, that'd be fine. And then after 30 days, I, we actually, Kelly, you know Kelly, the chef Kelly, who we have in our meetup group, we both started the uh, program. She didn't have to do it, but she's supporting me. And my biomarkers improved. My cholesterol dropped 20 points. My blood pressure was normal. And I was still on the meds though. So I didn't know, I mean, what the real results was. But so anyway, but that kind of gave me the afterthought to go ahead and do it. I lost six pounds in the process, which I wasn't looking to lose weight, but it just happens naturally. And my doctor said, keep up the good work, even though I told him about Dr. McDougall, what I was doing, he kind of rolled his eyes and wasn't, <laughs> thought I was doing okay. So anyway, after that, I decided I needed some really, some medical advice to um, help me through this. So I wanted to get off the meds um, because learned, reading the book, McDougall's book, and it really showed me he was reversing heart disease, diabetes, type two diabetes, and all these other things that were happening. So I decided in June 2007 to attend a 10-day living program that Dr. Madugal had in uh, Santa Rosa, California at the time, uh, where he becomes your doctor for 10 days and he basically teaches you about nutrition, teaches you about lifestyle changes, how to shop, how to eat out, and, and what the true causes of chronic diseases are, which you don't hear about a lot if you go to the conventional medicine docs. But anyway, I, I learned so much there, but he took me off my meds day one, which was kind of scary, but you know, I trusted him, he knew what he was doing. But in 10 days, I lost four pounds, cholesterol came down, my blood pressure was normal, even off the meds. And other participants in the 10-day program had similar results. 
Um, there was probably 22 people in our, pro in our program, um, all sorts of different issues, health issues with, you know, type two diabetes, uh, obesity, uh, and, you know, arthritis, name it. There was people there with looking for answers too, like I was. But the results were amazing in 10 days. Average weight loss was three pounds while eating unrestricted amounts of food. And it was just like eating a buffet of food. You go in there for lunch and it was much as we, we didn't count, no calorie counting, just eat. And you still lose weight. And that's the good thing. We'll get into why. Um, and my everybody's cholesterol dropped several points, which was good. Blood pressure in patients with hypertension dropped. Uh, and nearly 90% of the patients were able to get off blood pressure meds and, the, and diabetic medication, the type two diabetics. We had one type one high diabetic in there and he was, his insulin levels went down. But the type two, 90% of them, most of them, there was probably eight or nine, most of them got off their type two diabetic medications, which was amazing in 10 days. And, and so I was just amazed that it happened so fast and truly was a life-changing experience in 10 days. And I came back just wondering why uh, Conventional medicine and Western medicine doesn't know about this, you know, standard doctors, and we don't hear about it. So I was just amazed. And that's what kind of made me go into nutrition. I, I was uh, basically in IT for 40 years and decided to go back to school and learn about you know, nutrition. Of course, I read all the books, a China study, and learned from McDougal, Dr. McDougal, so much. It was great. So, Anyway, and today, reversing heart disease regained my health. I'm on no medications, which is uh, at my age, I'm 74 now, and people and doctors and people are just amazed that I'm not on medications. Most people my age are on a lot of medications. And I'm 35 pounds lighter. Just I'm maintaining my consistent weight, my set point weight now, pretty much really go up and down a few pounds here and there, but nothing major. Uh, cholesterol is always below 150, blood pressure is normal. McDougall's my hero, basically. He's my mentor, too, because I still talk to him, contact him every now and then. And I'm a star McDougaller. He has his website. There's He calls star McDougallers, people who have changed their health through his program. Um, and there's just hundreds of them, not just me, but it, it's it's an honor. So anyway, I'm joining this new career as a nutritionist, just trying to help people develop a lifestyle and just, get amazing results. And it's truly gratifying. So you can take care of your health. And that's what we'll talk about today, get into that a little bit. A uh, little bit more into detail. So food is medicine. So that's my belief. And I'm sure a lot of you had similar uh, experiences with this too. So it's it, it's great to hear all the good stories. So today we're just going to talk about this plant-based nutrition and what are the objectives. This this is a nutrition program is based on a low-fat plant-based diet, which is diet of whole foods, whole grains, vegetables, and fruit. You will learn the basic nutrition concepts and principles of macro and micronutrients. And it's all evidence-based on the benefits, which uh, there are many, of course, of nutrition and lifestyle from an expanded pers perspective. That is, nutrition as a symphony of complex interactions rather than just a result of single nutrient or mechanism. So we'll get into that a little bit. We don't want to isolate just one nutrient all the time. And we think we have a tendency to do that sometimes. And the science of nutrition and the fictions and benefits of carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and vitamins and minerals. And we'll talk about the lifestyle component of the health and wellness and longevity, because that, that's part of it, not just nutrition. We need to talk about our total lifestyle and how that plays a part in health and wellness. Two points to go through on just some of the statistics that's out there. Many of you know this, but uh, heart disease is still the number one killer in the United States. And it is preventable, treatable, and even reversible, as we know. Um, and the heart disease, uh, for me, uh, going back even to the 70s, I remember hearing about it still, it still was number one killer and still hasn't really changed. It's still number one killer. And we'll get into some of that, but that's still amazing to me. Um, the, the same is true for type 2 diabetes, and that's kind of skyrocketing. We're, we're really at an epidemic stage in that, so we'll, we'll talk about some of that, too. And more, many forms of cancer can be prevented by using uh, food as medicine. And high blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, acne, acid reflux, allergy, all these inflammation, autoimmune diseases are directly tied to an unhealthy light dietary lifestyle. And 70% of Americans are overweight or obese. And that's really gone up in the last 10 or 15 years. It used to be in maybe in the 50s, now 70%. So we need to address that issue. 
And why I think one of the major causes is our standard American diet, the SAD diet, we call it. Um, and you can see in this chart that 63% of food people eat in standard American diet is added fats, oils, sugars, refined grains, and fast foods. 25% is the animal products, of course, meat, dairy, eggs, fish, poetry, seafood, cholesterol, and the primary sources of saturated fat. And of course, only about 10 to 12% total of beans, um, veggies, fruits, and whole grains. And half of that, if you look up here, is the French fries, <laughs> fried foods and ketchup. So we're really not, standard American diet is not producing a lot of this, the good stuff so anyway. And then 185 pounds per year of added sugar, sweeteners, and we're eating, you know, consuming too much sodium on a daily basis, 34 milligrams, which should only be doing 1,500 to 2,300 milligrams a day. That's a recommended uh, amount. So but really, the diet's really one of the main causes of why we're having a lot of these issues. And of course, diabetes, like I mentioned, is on the rise. And it's getting worse. One in three people born after 2000 will have type 2 diabetes. And that's kind of a sad statement. Um, but there's good news. That's not all bad. You have the power to protect your health and prevent, suspend, and even reverse lifestyle diseases. The greatest wealth we have is health. So remember that, and we'll talk about that a little more in detail here. So some of the topics here we're going to talk about the key pillars of a healthy lifestyle and what is the whole fat, whole food, plant-based diet, the, the plant-based food, food groups, and do plants have complete nutrition, and debunking a lot of the myths and, and then with facts, and then some steps forward and final thoughts. So... One of the things I like that we like to talk about, key pillars of a healthy lifestyle, and there's five right now, but there's more than that, but there's these are the main ones. And if you talk, look at, talk to Dr. McDougal, a lot of these plant lifestyle medicine doctors that are out there today, mostly plant-based docs, they use this as their practice. And, and I try to use this in my practice too. And the first thing is diet and nutrition, which we're gonna recommend a plant-based diet, of course. And second is the one of the, Relieve stress, and how do we do that through meditation, yoga, walking, self-care, just taking care of yourself. And really stress is an inflammatory in, in your body. And so it does cause inflammation and that's causing a lot of stress. And that stress does, you know, creates a lot of the problems we have with health too. And meditation, I think is, is really misunderstood in a lot of ways. It's, there's a lot of science behind it now like the VA is using it to help PTSD. And there's a lot of studies that back in some California schools did it and, and for get their attendance up and the violences went down. So there's a lot of science behind it. So taking time, five, 10, 15 minutes of yourself just to be quiet, disconnect from the world, I believe is helping. We've got so much stuff going on. It's, relieving stress is very important. Love and support, family, friends, community is very important, obviously we need that. And that's part of the stress relief too. And we're social beings. We need to be connected with everybody. And a simple statistic I just saw that just the psychologists and sociologists have found that hugging somebody for 20 seconds will release oxytocin to you in your brain and you feel good. And it, it's kind of a stress relief. So give somebody a hug. <laughs> and movement is important. I don't, it's not have to be exercise, just move, walking, biking, yoga, whatever, just move. Whatever you like to do, walking upstairs, just move. That's important for our health, obviously. We all know that. And sleep, that's very important. We need to get our sleep. We need at least seven, eight hours of sleep. And, uh, and that because the body needs to repair itself, it gets rid of toxins and stuff. As long as it happens when you're sleeping. So it's important to get good sleep, good and restful sleep. And all these four things, five things will help in that area. And that's basically what I think is creating our healthy lifestyle. And that's what I like to see is a lifestyle, not just diet. Next, we'll talk about the blue zones here. I'm sure some of you have heard of that. Um, let me check the first distance real quick. Okay, we're all good. Um, anyway, this is a concept used to identify a demographic or, or geographic area of the world where people live measurably longer lives. And in these blue zones, they found people reach the age of 100 at rates 10 times greater than the United States. And their diet is over 90% plant-based, and we'll get into that. So there's a guy named Dan Butner who uh, found these blue zones, identified them actually. 
and that he's a Natural Beard Geographic Fellow, New York Times bestselling author, and he wrote The Blue Zones in 2005. <clears throat> and he's got several of the books out there, and he has his cookbook. But his research in the Blue Zone spent time, he actually lived with these people. And he, based on empirical data, historical data, and the firsthand observations, he saw the populations live healthier and longer lives. So he identified five longevity hotspots or blue zones. And they are Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, Nicoya, Costa Rica, Icara, Greece, and Loma Linda, California, which is here in the United States, which is amazing. They're Seventh-day Adventists. They're mostly vegan and vegetarian. So, and that, those are the ones he identified. I'll just give one example here, the Okinawans. Uh, the island of Okinawa in Japan is the best place for healthy aging. The diet consists mostly of sweet potatoes, which I was amazed, rice, vegetables, and some fish, no dairy products though. And they have more people, 100 years older per population than anywhere else in the world. But they have the lowest rates of heart disease, cancer, stroke, and top three killers here in the United States. So you rarely, he rarely saw those kind of diseases in, their population. And they had highest life expectancy for both males and females over 65. And the females in Okinawa have the highest life expectancy in, of all ages. So those are his experiences. And what he found <clears throat> with these people didn't go to gyms or anything like that. They just moved, they, whatever they did, you know, they take walks, they go to the store, walk, and they you know, tend to gardens, they or take care of grandkids. They all had, a, they, the, the main thing he found was they had a purpose. Whatever it is, you know, tending the grandkids, working in your garden, that was their purpose. And they had to be something major. But he found that's the main the main thrust of this. And, they, and the reason was all these things we talk about over here, we just mentioned, these types of things contribute to the longevity. By the way, I mentioned this on Netflix. You can go watch. He just came out with a video a couple months ago. Secrets of the Blue Zones, Dan Buettner's on it, and he goes through the Blue Zones and you can see some of the people and talks to them. So I recommend you can watch that, it'd be great. Okay, another topic here we'll talk about health span. It's a new term that's fairly new. Well, not, most people don't know about this. It's a concept for health now. And I've heard a lot of doctors talk about it. Dr. Stowe, some of these lifestyle medicine doctors really put this in the, <laughs> into the vocabulary as a, par a paradigm we should be looking at. And what is health span? It's just, is a period of life spent in good health, free from chronic diseases and disabilities of aging. Okay, that's the definition, but the, there's something wrong with this definition. We find there's some flaws because it's, it's a binary definition based on either health or disease. And that's, it's not an absolute. And it's passive in a way that doesn't give any hope to actually change your health. So that's one thing to think about. And then this classification of age-related diseases, they're really lifestyle diseases because the age may not matter because you can get, get a, a, a chronic disease at any age. So that's not really an age-related thing. So that's kind of a poor definition. And it's in the word of hurriedly defined word of health because health, you know, what is good health? I mean, you get uh, everybody has a different view of good health. You ask 10 different people what good what the health is, and they'll give you 10 different answers. So it's not a really good uh, way to do that. But you can lose and regain your good health. So we've all experienced that through a lifetime. So that's make sure we it's not an absolute definition. And we still have a high quality of life, even when we have a condition or disease. So it doesn't really tell us anything other than we can change. And this kind of theory of health span is that we have normal aging process. And then this is the age-related disease uh, thing we talk about. And the, the optimal you want to do is to minimize this age-related disease. Uh, and it, it's, um, oops, there you go. So anyway, that's kind of the new, new model. And you can minimize that. We'll get into some of that here a little bit. So <clears throat> health span is this, like our life expectancy is now what, 73, 73.2 years, I think is, it's, it went down actually the last, since the COVID and everything. So, and then the, this other thing is, I would say you live to 64 years and 9.2 of years is gonna be with some kind of health deficient disease or something. So it's an adjusted life expectancy. 
So we want to minimize this gap, and we'll talk about hopefully the plant-based diet and lifestyle will do this for you. So if you can minimize that, you live a healthy and more vibrant life. So that's the idea of health spin. And I thought I'd just bring it up because it is a new concept. You're not, you're not hearing much about it, but I think that's important when you start thinking of that you can change your, your lifestyle at any point in, your time, in life, doesn't matter how old you are. And the determinants of a healthy of high health span is this is the thing I think we should be going. And a lot of the med lifestyle medicine doctors are using this to treat patients, where they say 30% of <clears throat> your health span is genetics, biology, and healthcare. Where we want to be in this model here, where we want, we want to take in lifestyle, oops, sorry about that, lifestyle, environment, and epigenetics. And epigenetics, if you're not familiar with the science, it's been out there for decades, but starting to be now well known, where you can basically, genes aren't your destiny. Because we keep hearing that you, uh, you have this predisposition for a certain diabetes, heart disease. That's not necessarily true. I may have had disposition for heart disease, but I turned that gene off. Obviously, I'm here another 16 years. So epigenetics is just a way of managing your, gen your genome. And they do it through lifestyle. And then, and that's going to be what we talked about, the, the six pillars. And the, you know, diet, the stress relief, all of those things. And environment, this could be the toxins in the environment. It could be from stress. Stress is, is a toxin, in essence, an inflammatory thing. So if we can figure this, do this more with our lives versus, you know, depending so much on healthcare and, and believing that genetic genes are your uh, destiny, uh, then we'd probably be better off. Now, there's always exceptions. Genetics does come in with there's some defects and stuff. But for the most part, if you stick with this, I think you'll really see that we can change our health. And again, I'll bring up these key pillars of a healthy lifestyle. And if you incorporate those into your life, I think those will lengthen your longevity and how your health span. So it is about lifestyle choices, and nutrition is an important component of a lifestyle. That's going to be most of this lecture anyway. But the food choices you make affect your your weight, your body functions, and overall health and well-being. And the food we eat is one of the greatest effects on determining the quality of life. And the length of our lives. And so lifestyle does matter. That's why I bring it up. And you're starting to hear that more often, uh, not depending on, you know, the conventional medicine model all the time. So the question is, do you want to feel better, more energy? Do you want to improve, stabilize, or even reverse chronic conditions such as heart disease, high cholesterol, diabetes, or high blood pressure? Want to lose weight? Live, take fewer meds? That would be nice. Are you open to changing your diet if you can really improve your health? And But now is the time, and that's what we'll be talking about today. I'd like to show this definition first. I really love it. Uh, Dr. Uh, T. Colin Campbell, author of China Study and Whole Rethinking of Nutrition Science, has been studying nutrition for decades. Uh, and he's written the book, The China Study, is a really good book I recommend. But anyway, his definition is nutrition is a collective thing. A holistic idea that works in your body like a symphony, providing nutrients packaged by nature in a single food. And that really decides it all because it really is the food that in, the, in these nutrients and that really protect your body. So we'll get into a lot of that in, in the other topics. So we'll talk about what is a whole food plant-based diet. And uh, many of you know, but we'll go through the one we recommend. It's a whole food plant-based diet. It's centered on whole, one-refined plants and minimally refined plants, the processed foods. Try to minimize those uh, based on fruits, vegetables, tubers, uh, starchy vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And adding plenty of spices to enhance flavor of foods. If you've been to our cooking classes, you know Kelly adds a lot of those in our foods. We have a lot of spices. And we try to avoid the sugars and, and salt sparingly. Use it sparingly. I mean, if we put on salt on the table, we don't really cook with it, but... The more you can re reduce that, the better you'll be. And of course, we're going to exclude all animal products, the red meat, poultry, dairy, eggs, fish, which all provide toxic levels of fat, cholesterol, protein, and very often infectious agents and harmful chemicals, and all oils. And excluding all, all the oils, after all, all those oils, it's nothing more than liquid fat, <clears throat> increases body stores for weight gain, it has shown to depress immune function, and can contribute to chronic, chronic diseases. And this is probably one of the hardest ones that 
most people transitioning or trying to change to a plant-based diet have trouble with because they, you know, we've all heard that the olive oil and all these other good healthy oils, but not really. I mean, olive oil is probably one of the safer ones, but the Mediterranean diet you've heard of, of course, but it's not because of the olive oil, it's because of the other foods they eat. They eat a lot of vegetables in the Mediterranean diet and stuff. So it's really the oils. So Dr. Codwell Esselton, he's the author of Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, which is a really good book, <clears throat> says no oil. He's, at, he's emphatic about this, not even olive oil, which goes against a lot of the advice we hear out there, so-called good fats. And they're low in nutritive value and they have no fiber, trace minerals maybe, and they're 100% fat. One, one tablespoon of collard oil is 120 calories. So think of it that way. It's just, that's just all fat. It goes to your fat stores. It's not a whole lot there. And plus it does injure the endothelial layer of your blood vessels and your arteries. And that's the innermost lining. Um, and it's a gateway to vascular disease. So it doesn't matter if it's olive oil, coconut oil, corn. Coconut oil is probably one of the worst, actually, because it has more saturated fat than lard. So, you know, avoid those. I mean, that's a hard one to give up, I know. Um, and why not? Well, here's a, here's, a, here's a study that was done by Dr. John, Robert Vogel, who did a test on ingesting fats and oils and, and how it stiffened the arteries and the ability to dilate is impaired. And they did it by through an aflomedia dilation, FMD, which is... Uh, where they put a like a blood pressure cup on your arm and then they <clears throat> did an ultrasound probe and watch it on the screen and see, watch the blood flow and they can you see it moving slowly or fast, normal. So he's testing that <clears throat> with this. And the study used a mine study which showed potato soup meal containing three different vegetable oils, olive, soy, and palm. And then the FMD was performed and blood samples taken to establish the lipid profiles and glucose levels. All types of oil tested, including olive oil, resulted in similar acute endothelial impairment. So the blood flow is slow. It's like a traffic jam. It's like, it just doesn't move. You can see it. And it recovers in a two or three hours. So the meal actually impaired the endothelial and the blood flow. But the, the study said there was no difference found in the act acute adverse effect of the ingestion of different vegetable oils on endothelial function. All vegetable oils, fresh and deep fried, produced an increase in triglyceride plasma levels in healthy subjects. So every meal does do some damage. Another study done uh, with the flow media dilation again, where they ingested high fat meals, the three hour decline in FMD subject ingested a traditional high fat meal. And there's two groups. One group was fed fast food breakfast with 900 calories and 50 grams of fat. The second group was fed breakfast of 900 calories, no fat. So the no fat group, the arteries bounced back to normal as they were first measured. And for the high fat group, the arteries took significantly longer to return to normal. They say it's usually two to three hours before the arteries kind of bounce back. Uh, so that just shows the impact of a single meal have on an individual theaters. And over time, you can see it does have an effect. And this slide, this little image here is from the movie, The Game Changers documentary. I'm sure some of you have seen this, <clears throat> but it's basically all these plant-based, the world-class plant-based athletes who are plant-based and really are performing just as well as anybody else. And these, they did some, uh, on these college athletes, they took some blood, blood work. They had, gave them a plant-based black bean burrito and they gave them a meat burrito and they did blood test afterwards. And they see the clear side here. That's the plant-based side. It's clear. This is all fat. So that after a, even a single meal, you can see the saturate, the fat building up in your blood. So that gives you a good indication what happens when you consume that. So we'll get into the food groups. Uh, here's what we recommend, the starches, non-starchy vegetables and fruits of all types. Of course, starches or potatoes, beans, whole grains, brown rice, barley, oatmeal, all those and squashes of all types. And of course, all the non-starchy vegetables, all the leafy greens, the carrots, collard greens, all that good stuff and fruits of all types. So there's no limitation in all this stuff. So the whole foods are now, we've been shown scientifically proven to provide optimal balanced nutrition and therefore an ideal for all human beings. 
And because of their high complex carbohydrate content and low fat content, they are ideal for weight loss. Also, these foods contain all the immune boosting antioxidants we need, you hear about all the time. Not only plants have these antioxidant vitamins such as vitamin C, EK, and beta carotene, just to name a few. And animal foods are exceedingly low or devoid of all of any of these antioxidants. Next, we'll talk about the dreaded carbs, complex carbs, the starches, the good stuff. Um, <clears throat> carbohydrates are primary source of in energy for all humans. It's always has been, but that's the body. The body looks for that first. They supply four calories per gram, same as protein. Fat has more than twice as many calories as nine grams per protein. And then the, <clears throat> and there's abundance of fiber in the carbs, complex carbs, and the fiber has no calories because it's absorbed by the body. How do we digest this? Well, the science shows that eating the complex carbs found in starches, potatoes, rice, and beans, they are in, digested into simple sugars in the intestine. And then they get absorbed into the bloodstream <clears throat> and transported to the cells, and it provides the energy for us. And these long chains of glucose with, you know, or sugars must be broken down inside the intestine before they can be used. So it takes time to do all that and break it all down. The process of digesting these complex sugars is slow, methodical, and it provides a steady stream of fuel pumped into your bloodstream as long-lasting energy. And that's why you hear a lot of these, especially these, these athletes say that their energy is up. And people who switch to a plant-based diet, their energy, they seem to get more energy now. And I, I noticed that too when I've switched. <clears throat> So what are complex carbs or these starches? They're the primary source for muscles and it's glucose absorbed from the bloodstream or stored as glycogen in muscles and liver. <clears throat> Store, total storage capacity for glycogen in your body is two pounds. And the mu muscles draw down the glycogen uh, from, from the mitochondria inside the cells and the next meal filled with glycogen stores up again. So you draw down on that on, through a day and you hear the stories about these athletes hitting the wall, that's basically their glycogen store is depleted. So you need that glucose and it's not all bad. And people, you know, you know bash all the, all the carbs, but, uh, but we're just carbohydrates, sugar burning beans, that's all we are. And they don't make you fat, see so that uh, myth will debunk through a process called factory dietary thermogenesis, which are excess carbohydrates that are burned off as heat or energy and used it in physical movement, not associated with exercise. So just sitting here, you're burning uh, the carbohydrates off in your skin, whatever. It's just, just and even walking, you're, you're burning all that off. So it doesn't make you fat. The body doesn't have, uh, doesn't know how to require to store that. It takes a lot of work for the body to do that. And fat is a secondary source of energy that can be used with some tissue such as muscle, but it's often stored for use in famine. So. The first thing the body tries to do, and this is every human being, it looks for glucose, looks for the starch, the carbohydrates. If it doesn't find that, the next goes to the fat. So I'll, I'll start to get the energy I need for, for the fat. And the third thing is protein. That's hard for it to, to produce energy from protein. And that's where the low carb people, that's, it's a difficult task, but it's working, but that's not how the body works. Even the potato, yes, you can eat these things. They're not gonna make you fat. <laughs> I eat a lot of potatoes and I love them. But look at this, the vitamins and minerals you're gonna get from it. And just, well, this is a small potato too. So, and there's, uh, this Dr. Medulla calls this probably the healthiest food on the planet. It's the only thing it may be lacking is vitamin A, but it has every other nutrient you need. In fact, there is a guy in Australia, I don't know, he uh, went on an all potato diet, Andrew Taylor, for a year. He was morbidly obese. He was uh, food addictions and depressed. And he was in his 30s. He went on an all potato diet, thought, looked at Dr. Moogle's website and started eating potatoes for a year, which I couldn't do, but that's, he did. And he survived and has lost over 140 pounds and his blood work was perfect. And he's, he has a website now trying to send a message out there too. Now, so potatoes aren't bad for you. Don't, don't be... Uh, now it's what you put on potatoes is where people get in trouble. <laughs> um, they're low in calories, have many minor vitamins and minerals. <clears throat> and we try to avoid these simple carbs or empty calories, basically processed foods, carbohydrate foods, those uh, you know sugar baked goods, white snack foods, can candy, soft drinks, all those non-dietary drinks. 
leads to white flour, stuff like that. We try to avoid those are called the bad carbs. So there are bad carbs. <clears throat> the good carbs are the complex carbs. And we try to avoid the, the, uh, the simple carbs if we can. So all carbs are not equal. So <clears throat> starch is clean fuel. fuel. It's very low in fat. It's one to eight percent of their calories, eight percent of their calories. Contains, contains no cholesterol, <clears throat> and it doesn't grow any human pathogens like salmonella, E. coli, et cetera. If there is salmonella, that comes from animal sources or cross-contamination, usually when you hear about it in uh, lettuce or some of those other foods. So it's not really in the plant. They're coming from other sources. Um, <clears throat> And they, don't, they do not store chemicals like DDT and methylmercury, which you'll find in methylmercury and found in a lot of the commercial fish nowadays, which isn't good. And starch is complete nutrition. It's plentiful in protein, 28% of their calories is protein. It, can, it contains all the vitamins and minerals you need. And it's full of dietary fiber, which helps boost the immune system with the microbiome, the gut microbiome, which is very important. We'll hear a lot about that, the gut health. And it's very energy satisfying. So it's, it's comfort food. And that's why I look at it. potatoes, some of these other foods, rice, beans, corn, all that is comfort food. And they just fill you up, keep you full. And this is, Dr. McDougall really pushes this one to say all large populations of trim, healthy people throughout verifiable human history have obtained the bulk of their calories from starch, which is true. And here's some examples, the barley, Middle East for 11,000 years, Corn from North Central South America for 7,000 years. Legumes in the Americas, Asia, Europe for 6,000 years. Africa, millet, 6,000. Oats, Middle East. Potatoes, South America, a lot of potatoes. Sweet potatoes, South America again. And rice, of course, the Asians eat over 10,000 years been eating rice. So we've been, in, we've been eating starch forever and it's never harmed us back then, but now they're starting to poo-poo it. So here's, Dr. McDougall's, and this is the, that's what I teach, the starch solution, <clears throat> where you can eat the food you love, regain your health, and lose the weight for good. And this is kind of my plate now. This is like starch, 70% is starch, and 10, 15, and 20% is vegetable and fruits. <clears throat> and you can cut this in half if you're looking for weight loss. We can, we'll talk about that in calorie density. Put that to 50-50, and you're, getting, you're getting, still getting the starch, but you're getting less calories, so you can lose weight faster. And you're still going to lose weight this way. But in my, uh, my estimation, you get about two to three pounds. I was averaging two to three pounds a week, and that's what you'll see commonly if you eat this this way. It used to be my steak, now it's starch. So that's kind of the way to look at it. Next, we'll talk about fiber a little bit. <clears throat> it's why it's so important in your diet. Um, it's just part of the plant doesn't break down in your stomach. It passes through through a system un undigested. And all dietary fiber is either soluble or insoluble. And both types are very important for health to maintain weight, digestion, preventing conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, obesity, diverticulitis, and constipation. That's very important. And both the soluble and insoluble fiber are undigested. They don't absorb into the bloodstream. That's why you can lose weight with it because it's undigested. It provides zero calories. <clears throat> Instead of being used for energy, fiber is excreted from the body, and soluble fiber dissolves in water, insoluble fiber does not. It's kind of the difference, no big deal, don't worry about it. Uh, to some degree, these differences determine how fiber functions in the body and benefits your body. Uh, and a high fiber diet that has many benefits, <clears throat> normalize your bowel movements, helps maintain the bowel health, lowers cholesterol, helps control blood sugar levels with diabetes especially, it's really important, aids in achieving a healthy weight. So the recommended fiber intake is, is 25 to 35 grams a day as a minimal. Optimally, your goal should be 40, but currently the average American is maybe getting 10 to 15 grams a day, eating the standard American diet, <clears throat> mostly meat and dairy. Uh, but if you follow a whole food plant-based diet, the, the, the nutrition the program, you're gonna eat about 40, 60 grams. I'm probably eating 60, 80 grams of fiber a day. So it keeps you regular, let's put it that way. Um, and in, if you're not eating a lot of fiber now, take it in slowly um, because it, it, it may cause a lot of gas and bloating and stuff. So and increase your water intake. If you are starting out to eat a lot more fiber, just 
be aware of that. Uh, here's some fiber content of uh, some foods, beans, get plenty of protein, seven grams, you get a half a cup. Vegetables, you got four grams per cup, and fruit, you get about three grams. So there's protein in every every plant, no matter what it is. So not to worry, we'll get into that in a little bit. And there's some new information coming out with fibers. It can be a prebiotic, which is a food for healthy gut microbes. So you don't need a, a supplement in, in essence, you could, but this fiber does have some prebiotic effect. But not all fiber is prebiotic, almost soluble fiber, soluble fiber is prebiotic, while most insoluble is not. So just mix it up. <clears throat> uh, insoluble fiber is called roughage. So just important to get both insoluble fiber. Don't worry too much about it. Just eat a lot of the, you know, the plant-based foods. You're gonna get the fiber. Um, <clears throat> and the mixture of both fibers, you're gonna get plenty. And usually the food labels don't tell you which is which. So be sure to eat plenty of fiber, whether it's soluble or insoluble. It's all good. It all works. And there's some foods kind of boost your gut bacteria, which blueberries are real the best ones. Bananas, and potatoes again. All these foods are just eat a variety. And that's what we try to tell people: it's the variety. It's it's eating the rainbow, and you'll really help your gut. I'd like to show this little video. <clears throat> uh, if if any, don't know if anybody remembers Drano. If you're old enough, remember this commercial on TV. I got this from. Uh, a commercial there is used the Drano commercial, which cleans the pipes in your in your house. But this is how how fiber works. This is how it really works. And this is when it doesn't work. You're stuck. So <laughs> fiber is good. Next, we can talk about <clears throat> calorie density, which should help talk about weight loss. So what is calorie density? Well, it's how much energy is provided by per unit of measure, usually in the pound. Um, example here is one pound of vegetables is only 100 calories, and one pound of ground beef, depending on the ground beef, is 1,000 calories. And one pound of vegetables, 100, think about that's why the starch is an important component here, <clears throat> because if you're just eating vegetables, broccoli, and carrots, you're going to be hungry in an hour. So that's why the, the starch component is always important to get you full. But anyway, you can see the difference in calories. And, and calorie dense foods are the high calorie density foods, such as fat <clears throat> that comes from the animal products and refined sugars. They provide many calories in a small amount of food. Whereas the low de calorie density foods, fruits and vegetables, uh, provide <clears throat> fewer calories with a greater nutritional value. Um, some of these principles, here's all calories aren't equal. Well, here's why. Fat, one gram of fat is nine calories, protein four grams, carb is four grams. Example, a 50 gram carbohydrate potato, which is probably a medium sized potato, say it's a baked potato, it's only 200 calories. <clears throat> the meat, 50 grams of fat is nine times nine is 450 calories. So you can see you'd more than double your calorie intake there. And I love to show this slide. This is Dr. McDougall's. I've, he did a live demo on this where basically this is your stomach <clears throat> size. It's kind of these glass jars. It size your stomach. And the 50 calorie meal in your stomach is on the right side. We've got <clears throat> cheese, red meat, and butter. Left side, we've got potatoes, corn, and rice, the starch. So <clears throat> on this side, there are less nutrients, more fat, less, more cholesterol, less filling, eat more. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. That's Dr. McDougall's quote. But anyway, you can see the butter. <clears throat> 500 calories of butter does barely touches your bottom stomach. The red meat, maybe a third of it or half of it. And then cheese, of course, 500 calories of cheese will get there. But what happens is you have receptors in your stomach that talk to your brain and say, okay, I'm full. I can't eat it. They're up here. It doesn't receive that. So you're still hungry. So you can pile on some more food, you know, put on the cheesecake, whatever, like that type of stuff. And you still, and you're gonna, and calorie wise, you're eating more than 500 calories, obviously, and people can eat up to 1,000 calories in one meal. Whereas in the <clears throat> starch side, you got the rice, 500 calories of rice, which is a lot, almost fills your stomach. 500 calories of corn, is, you're full. And 500 calories of potatoes, that's probably two and a half potatoes. You're full, you can't eat anymore. I mean, you're, your book says I'm full. The brain says, ah, that's it. Of course, oops, sorry. But the brain says, <clears throat> I'm done. And there's 
getting the more nutrient value, stomach's full, and you, there's no cholesterol. So you can see the big difference and why we, you know, eat so much and we shouldn't. And satiety is important because the plant-based foods are high in water, high in fiber, and they create bulk. We, it helps the bowel movements and they're high in nutrients. So calorie density really is a common sense approach to sound, sound nutrition and the cornerstone of good health. Simplest way to lose and manage your weight for life. You can have more food for fewer calories. It's easy to understand and follow. And you just follow these principles. You increase the amount of food you're on your plate while decreasing the overall calorie, caloric intake, all without ever going hungry. And all at the same time, you're just you're getting all the nutrients you need, vitamins, minerals, protein, essential fats, all that. And I mean, like, we don't care. Like I mentioned in the beginning with the Dr. Douglas program, his 10-day living program, we, it's, we ate unlimited amounts of food and just and there was people lost weight. So it's just not. It's not calorie counting or anything, just eat what they're hungry, eat. And <clears throat> studies have shown that diets based on low calorie density foods tend to be healthier and more efficient for weight management. And this next chart <clears throat> really kind of shows some of the major principles of calorie density and <clears throat> why we gain weight and kind of on, on you, you want to eat the foods on this little green side, let bar non-starchy vegetables, fruit, and unref unrefined carbon complex carbs, which is the starch, basically. And that's where you're going to lose most of your weight. <clears throat> now, if you're adding some avocados, be careful. If you're looking for weight loss, they're going to be high. They're a good source of nutrients and stuff, but they're high in fat, of course. And, of course, you want to stay away from dairy and cheese, the chocolates. Nuts and seeds are healthy, but, but again, it's a higher-fat food. So if you're looking for weight loss, avoid those for a while. And you start getting your goal weights, maybe bring those back in. But in all oils, of course, are very just fat, high fat. So this kind of shows you, and we talk about this a lot, and Chef AJ and all these other uh, healthcare and chefs talk about this kind of calorie density principle. And, and that's the way to really, if you're looking for weight loss, the way to do it. So the next topic will be, do plants have complete nutrition? And we say yes. <clears throat> so mac macronutrients is carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. You've heard that before. <clears throat> They're the larger amounts of foods we need, protein and fat, carbs, and they provide the body with energy and calories. And the vitamins and minerals are the micronutrients, <clears throat> which are less, smaller in, in amounts, and they are coming kind of through as vitamins and minerals. Um, and of course, <clears throat> vitamins, most Americans eating a standard American diet are vitamin and mineral deficient because of the animal processed foods. And because they many take supplements based on the real or perceived deficiency they have, because <clears throat> they're not getting it in the standard American diet, which we mentioned was this. <laughs> We're trying to avoid that. Um, and whole foods have all the nutrients that the body requires, carbohydrates, protein, fat, vitamins, mineral fiber, and sufficient calories. So there should be no need for added supplements when following a whole food plant-based diet, other than <clears throat> two vitamins, B12 and vitamin D. B, vitamin D we get from sunlight. Some people need supplementation, that's okay. You need to get your levels checked, but for the most part, if you're healthy, you really shouldn't have to. And some fortified cereals have the B, uh, vitamin D. I think soy milk, you can see some of those soy, plant milks have it. B12, you have to get from a supplement because the body doesn't produce B12. It comes from bacteria from animal products, the animal. <clears throat> but you store it for years. So you can, after you're following a plant-based diet for more than three years, you should be on a B12 supplement. And you don't need a lot. The recommendation by the World Health Organization is five micrograms, but they don't sell it that way. You have the smallest doses I've seen is 500 micrograms. So just taking one them every day or you don't you can do it every other day it doesn't really matter you're getting plenty once a week some people do it once a week that's fine <clears throat> so just take a b12 supplement and that will satisfy the, the the vitamin nutrients and this chart kind of gives you a really big picture of <clears throat> the vitamins and minerals that are in all plants just a variety this is only some of it but like vitamin A's and sweet potatoes, carrots, red pepper, spinach, kale, 
B6 is the spinach red pepper. So just again, the rainbow, the versity, the rainbow of foods, you're gonna get the mixture of all this stuff. In fact, B12 you can get from seaweed, oops. You can eat um, <clears throat> sushi or something like that, vegetable sushi, they get some B12. But animal products have a lot of B12, of course. Um, the vitamin C, about red bell peppers has more vitamin C than an orange. So even just to add red bell peppers, you can get the vitamin C. Of course, the D we talked about, the E, spinach, kale, all the greens, vitamin K, all the kale. So these are all essential vitamins we need, and you're going to get plenty of that with the uh, plant-based uh, foods. Minerals, of course, are another group of nutrients that the body needs. Not a lot of it, but needs it for blood clotting, heartbeat, maintenance of pressure of body fluids and nerve responses, the transport of oxygen to the lungs. And they make a small percentage, it's only about 4% of the body, So, <clears throat> but we need them. They're very important for life. Uh, here again is a chart showing all the uh, different uh, minerals and what we can get from all these, like calcium from broccoli and basil. So there's calcium in all these uh, leafy greens, iron, leafy greens, nuts, seeds, magnesium, whole grains, legumes, magnesium, kale, phosphorus. All these foods have all these nutrients and sodium from sea salt, um, zinc, all that. So we're plenty. We're getting plenty of minerals too. So. Again, diversity is the key, the rainbow. Don't just isolate one, one food or anything. We try to mix it up during the week. Next, we're going to debunk some of these <clears throat> plant-based myths. As to go through this. So the question that many of us get, I'm sure many of those who are plant-based out there, uh, don't get enough protein. Where do you get your protein? That's the question we always get. <clears throat> I like to show this cartoon because it says no meat at all. Are you sure you're getting enough protein? I think so. The gorillas are good. <laughs> um, so yeah, protein is really misunderstood and consequently most abused substance in our food food chain, food supply, because all plants contain protein of all, <clears throat> all we need. Uh, it contains a complete protein, meaning they contain all the essential amino acids and or the building blocks of protein, essential amino acids. There's only nine essential amino acids and you have to get those from food. The body doesn't produce them. And there's 11 more that your body produces. So, so we get plenty of protein. Don't worry about the amino acids, you're getting all that, but you have to get some from food. Um, and you need a diet compressed exclusively of plant foods. So it's gonna come from there. And think about it. Plants, the only food eaten by elephants, horses, hippos, and giraffes. And they have no trouble growing muscles, I can see in this cartoon. You know, they think they're fine. They're herbivores and they're fine. So that plants provide plenty of protein. Uh, here's an example. Broccoli contains 45% protein. Calories and beans contain 9 to 30, depending on the variety. Source, other sources, spinach, kale, broccoli, pinto beans, brown rice, baked potatoes, all have protein, and many, many more. So every plant has certain amounts, of course, more vary. Cross, so don't worry. And the next is excess protein, too much protein <clears throat> causes diseases of, diseases of overnutrition. Unlike fat, protein cannot be stored in the body. And people misconstrue that. We don't store protein. We can store the, <laughs> the, the fat, the carbohydrates for energy, but you can't store protein. Consumption of more than what the body needs overworks the liver and kidneys and causes accumulation of toxic protein byproducts. <clears throat> and these byproducts are removed from finally through the kidneys through a urine. And these also these amino acid waste, they can injure the structure of the kidneys over time. <clears throat> and over time, these uh, diets high in protein may promote development of kidney stones. You hear about that. Other health issues such as bone loss, osteoporosis, arthritis, and kidney damage. Because your body's trying to be in pH balance. It's trying to be alkaline. If you get all these pro animal, especially animal protein, plant proteins doesn't have the acid. It's the acid that causes <clears throat> you to lose into osteoporosis, bone loss, and all those types of kidney and kidney stones. Because the acid in, pro in the animal protein, is, it, it causes the bones to release calcium. Because your body's trying to always buffer that acid. So it pulls calcium from the bones, and then that buffers that. So you're, you're injuring your bones, taking that, uh, pro, that calcium out. So that's what causes a lot of the arthritis, osteoporosis stuff. So once people switch to a plant-based diet, it restores that calcium, and you, you see the, the results of that. 
through, you know, people with arthritis get their joints back and stuff. So it's very important to understand that these high protein diets are not the answer. <clears throat> it's very acidic. Your body doesn't like acid and it's going to buffer that because it's going to create a response in your body. So <clears throat> this chart kind of shows you what the protein intake is worldwide. The Western diet, we're getting probably 100 to 760 grams a day protein. 15 30% 5% of that. <clears throat> Rural Asia, you're only getting you're getting 40 to 60 grams, which is 14% of your calories based on a 2,000 calorie diet. McDougal diet, which I follow in my program and I, what we eat, is 30 to 80% protein. That's 7 to 15% of your calories. When you get in these low carb <clears throat> keto diets and stuff like that, it's 200 to 400 grams per day. That's 37% of your calories. That's too much protein, I believe. And they're, they 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 long term study haven't sh shown any they're showing the short term study show that it doesn't really help you you lose the weight and stuff but they're dangerous I believe. So the next uh, myth we want to debunk is calcium. So all plant foods contain all the generous amounts of calcium. Uh, they're leafy greens, legumes, get plenty of calcium. Broccoli, Brussels sprouts, all, all those greens have that absorbable calcium. A host of things. Uh, the exception is spinach, which contains a large amount of calcium, which tends to hold off and not be absorbed into the body. <clears throat> so that's the exception. But most of the other things, you're going to be able to absorb the calcium. And this chart kind of shows, you know, one cup of broccoli is calcium is 83 milligrams. It's, you're absorbing 52% of it <clears throat> and only getting 48 calories. So it's very low in calories. If you drink a cup of milk, it's 291 milligrams of calcium but it's only 32 absorption, but you're getting 150 calories of saturated fat, cholesterol, all the bad stuff you don't really want in your body. So yes, Brussels sprouts, kale, mustard greens has plenty of calcium. So you're not gonna be deficient. Um, calcium comes from the ground. It's a mineral in the soil through the living roots of the plant. So that's where you get it. And where does the cow get it? Oh, interesting, huh? <laughs> gets it from the grass. It doesn't have the calcium in them. It takes it from the plants. So that's another debunk. Uh, source other sources, plant-based milks, of course, collard greens, uh, kale, broccoli, all those plenty of calcium like we talked about. This chart shows um, <clears throat> why of the, kind of the osteo hip fractures per calcium consumed in the world. And it kind of shows that this consumption is mostly from dairy, this, this chart shows, per day. And you can see the United States and New Zealand have the most hip fractures per calcium. If the more you consume of these dairy products and stuff, the more of hip fractures they're going to have. And if you look at the lower ones, these are Singapore, which eats pretty a lot of plant-based foods, whole kind of, they have less of these fractures. So Next, we can talk about the clinical evidence studies, uh, and success stories that come from plant-based eating. Uh, this is the study lifestyle heart trial. I'm sure many of you heard of it. It's uh, done in 1990 by Dr. Dean Ornish, who took two groups of heart patients, 28 heart disease people treated with lifestyle changes only. And 20 of the people, heart disease people, were treated with standard treatments from the doctors who treated them. It was a randomized controlled trial and determined whether comprehensive lifestyle changes affected coronary atherosclerosis after one year. And here's pretty much the trial. It was pretty, it was pretty basic, but nothing really drastic, I think. Uh, it was vegetarian diet food. It really was a vegan diet. <clears throat> Half hour walk daily, and they managed stress. Stress relief is important. Just to avoid tobacco. Those are the four things they really did for a year. And here's the results after a year. Cholesterol dropped 24%, patients LDL dropped 37%, and the res result was 82 of the participants reversed their heart disease, like, and that's 22 out of 28 people actually reversed, did a reversal heart disease. And here's the example, <clears throat> the, the year before, the year after, this artery was clogged, basically blocked. You can see that. And then this one, a year later, it actually opened up, which is truly amazing to see that. And, and but you know the, the thing you say, but well, what happened to the other 
patients who didn't get the reversal. They had some reversal, but <clears throat> not dramatic. But if, what I've been told by Dr. McDougall and these other experts that even though you may not reverse the blockage, you're still your arteries are getting healthier, repairing those endothelial layers in your cells and your blood vessels. So it's it's repairing, you get better blood flow. So and the, the old plaque it turns into concrete, so it doesn't damage, it doesn't hurt you anymore. You're basically your arteries are smooth and it's, it's, so it, it's an amazing study. <clears throat> But uh, basic understanding why we how we can reverse heart disease. This is from Dr. Colin Lesselton's book. Uh, is that we that every meal, oil, dairy, and meat <clears throat> within minutes to damage the injury to the life jackets, the endothelial layers we talks about. And these endothelial cells produce these magic gases called nitric oxide, which you've heard of, and the blood vessels that relaxes our blood vessels, prevents uh, <clears throat> the, the clogging of the arteries. And the platelets that they come up, it becomes sticky, and prevents that growth of plaque, and then threading the hardening of arteries. So it makes it smooth and get like Teflon. So it repairs the lay layers. It's never too late to change it either. So I, there's a lot of people I've talked to, some some patients that uh, Dr. McDougall knows that their arteries actually got stronger. So it's it's really amazing how it works. So what can you eat to improve these endothelial functions in your body? Leafy greens, beans, scale, all those things we've just been talking about. And repair the arteries and blood vessel and blood flow. Um, as, as soon as you stop eating damaging foods, the endothelial cells <clears throat> have the capacity for res restoration. And you switch to the whole food plant-based diet uh, with exercise is important. And they uh, are the key. So it's never too late to change. We've had people in the 70s and 80s change their diet and re reverse heart disease. So it's, it doesn't matter what age. And here's a quote from Dr. Esselton, who it's a pretty bold, profound statement, <clears throat> but he believes it. And I believe it too. And it's a food, if the truth be known, coronary artery disease is a toothless paper tiger that never need ever exist. And if it does exist, it never ever progress. Pretty profound, but he's the expert. <clears throat> and this other dietary intervention study, of course, as I mentioned, I, I went through for 10 days with Dr. McDougall in Santa Rosa. He did a study of 1,615 patients. My results are in this uh, study where I taught, mentioned that he a lot of people average three pounds of weight in a week. Average cholesterol reduction is 22 milligrams per deciliter. An average decrease in blood pressure, 18 to over 11 with patients hypertension. So, and nearly 90% of the patients were able to get off blood pressure and diabetic medications. And that's type two diabetic medications, of course. So that's you know his study, which he's produced in findings in journals. Again, I believe this health span model is the way to go with banking on lifestyle environment, epigenetics as much as you can to avoid the biology, the healthcare system, and worrying about the biology and genetics. The genetics aren't your destiny all the time. Oh, that's our plant-based health and wellness stuff we did in 2019. <clears throat> we haven't done it since COVID. Hopefully, never someday we can get back to doing it. We brought in many of the doctors and chefs, Dr. Stoll, Dr. Freeman here in town. So, uh, <clears throat> so and uh, Dr. Stanzik, we had our summit in 2019. I don't know if you've heard of her. She has a documentary called Code Blue. Redefining, redefining the practice of medicine and where she was uh, diagnosed with MS at a young age where she's a resident. <clears throat> and we, now she's fine 20 years later, running marathons. She was on a ton of medications. She couldn't get out of bed. She's in a wheelchair, but now she's fine. But she's an amazing woman. She spoke at our conference in 2019. Her story is just amazing. She has a book out, What's Missing from Medicine. So I recommend that documentary if you ever have a chance. Okay, to wrap it up, I think we're running a little over, but um, summary is that plant-based nutrition is the, staying within starchy vegetables, green, yellow vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. Consuming a variety of foods within the food groups ensures a greater intake of the nutrients you need. Whole is greater than some of its price. So don't isolate one nutrient. Look at the whole picture of all the plants in the world and you'll be fine. And remember, nutrient works in the body. It's, it is a symphony. Each cell talks to each other about this stuff. 
and they contain all the immune, immune boosting and antioxidants. It refers to vitamins, phytochemicals, other compounds that we need, and kind of gets rid of these free radicals that damage the body, cancer causing, inflammation, arthritis, all these other things we don't want. And adequate amounts of antioxidants are needed to fight off damaging free radicals and other immune boosting. Plants have all the vitamins and minerals we need, of course. Animal foods are exceeding low and devoid of these. As you plan your manual, be generous with a variety of fruits and vegetables because they all load with antioxidants. And then health benefits are new, the numerous that are benefits of a healthy diet. And in fact, it's been shown 80% of chronic diseases are preventable, especially with the shift to plant-based diet and the lifestyle. Don't forget the lifestyle. Here's the numerous benefits of health, for which you, many of you know, prevents reverse heart disease, type 2 diabetes, decreases cancer risk, slows the progression of certain cancers, lowers blood pressure, blood sugar, lower cholesterol, prevent all, all autoimmune diseases, improves digestive bowel movements, enables healthy weight loss. Our gut flora and microbiome is going to improve, boost in, uh, immune functions, environmental friendly. We're saving the planet too. So there's a whole other topic and improves your energy and blood flow. So here's a chart kind of just <clears throat> shows you the more you can go to a plant-based diet, the more results you can get and the more benefits you receive. So if you go 50%, you're still going to get the benefits. Go 100%, not everybody can do that, I know, but you can you know, at least make that a goal that you're going to get more, more benefit. So what is the optimal diet? <clears throat> not this. We don't want the standard American diet. We want, if you can do the start solution, that's great. Dr. McDougall. 70% starch, fruits, vegetables, water, all that stuff will work. And here's kind of what we do eat, still the oatmeal's a good comfort food again, mock tuna, one of my favorites, use that when I travel. That's uh, garbanzo beans with some vegan mayo and uh, <clears throat> we're fixings for tuna. It tastes just like tuna to me. Uh, hearty vegetable stew. Capitalina pomodoro, bean and corn enchiladas, green and corn for each other. These are very heartwarming foods and they fill you up. So those are some of the good stuff. Just add plenty of fruits and vegetables, non-starchy vegetables to your diet. <clears throat> and here, the steep dry plant foods are more effective than health than any supplement or pill. Let the body heal itself with the right food. The body has this amazing ability to heal. It's always looking to heal. You scratch yourself, cut yourself. Your body automatically tries to heal that wound. This does the same thing with food. And it truly heals the whole body. And food diversity, again, that's important in lifestyle changes, which we talked about in the beginning, the pillars of a healthy lifestyle, relieving stress, movement, all those things, love and support we need. And integrate these key pillars of, into your life as much as possible. So empower yourself to be a good consumer of your health. Be informed. Remember, knowledge is power. And even making small changes in your diet and lifestyle can make a significant difference in your health and well-being. Why wait for disease or diagnosis? Change. It's never too late. <clears throat> now is the time. The cool thing is that people are waking up. Trust the food. They're the only good side effects, no bad ones. And hypocrisy had it right. That food be thy medicine, medicine be thy food. Greatest wealth is health. Okay, thanks. And the, the, some of the stuff we do, we do in the cooking classes through our meetup group, you, you're aware of. Um, doing trying to do more nutrition classes, and I do nutrition consultations and programs. Don't have any future events planned like the summits we used to do, but uh, that's about it. So appreciate it. Appreciate your thoughts. If we have any time, maybe got to throw it through the chat window. I can look at some questions we have here. Yeah, okay, see if I can get some of these. Oops, sorry about that. Can you explain insulin resistance and how would you vegan diet be beneficial? Okay, yeah, insulin resistance, the, re the reason it can reverse type two diabetes is because the reason, the things that most conventional medicine doesn't understand is how uh, insulin resistance works. Our cells need glucose for energy. And insulin is the key. Look at it, think of it as a locking key. The insulin is, is the key that tries to lock the <clears throat> cells to open it up so the glucose can get in for energy. What happens with the high fat diet 
my standard American diet is that those cells get clogged up with fat, that you, your pancreas releases the uh, insulin and it can't open that cell to get the glucose so the glucose bounces off into your bloodstream and, and the sugar, your glucose sugar goes up. So what happens when you go to a plant-based diet, you basically, you're, you're limiting your fats, your cells start to heal, get rid of the fat and the glucose can get in, your blood sugar goes down. That's pretty a uh, basic understanding of it. And then, Cause you're insulin resistant, you're not being able to get the glucose. So your, your blood sugar goes up. <clears throat> so that's kind of the way it works. I hope that answered your question. Maybe have a copy of the slides. Uh, yeah, I can put those out there, um, but I can also, I mean, the, I'll have a YouTube video you can look at again if you want to go through it and maybe answer some of your questions. Okay, this one question. I've been practicing whole food plant-based diet for over years, still have digestive issues. And learning about <clears throat> oxalates um, from the movement map, yeah, that is a problem. Some people do have a trouble with oxalates, and that's why uh, I mentioned the spinach. If you can avoid the oxalate type foods, that can eliminate that. But that, that, yeah, that one has to be really looked at in detail with the diet. But if you can email me, and I, I can um, maybe can lead you in the right direction with some of that stuff. Uh, Carol has a question about bodybuilders need to consume a lot of protein to build um, build muscle. No, if you if you look at um, <clears throat> documentary, I don't know if you saw it in the beginning, the the uh, game changers they go into a lot of this stuff, and all these bodybuilders and other other plant based athletes don't eat a lot of protein. They don't use protein supplements or any of that stuff because you're going to get all they do is increase their calorie intake. If, you, if you're, say I eat 2,000 calories a day, which is typically what I do, but if I wanted to eat more protein, I just I would have up it to 3,000 calories a day. And being an athlete, if you're an athlete, you're gonna burn that off anyway. 3,000 to 4,000 calories of plant-based food is gonna give you the enough protein. So you'll see a lot of these plant-based athletes just up their calorie intake to get the protein they need. So now you don't need to take a supplement for it. Regarding, here's a question from Brenda. Um, regarding calcium, for example, aren't soils depleted, thereby requiring application of fertilizer such as least soil crops? Correct, you're very, very, very right. Our soils are getting depleted and that's because of the way we farm. It's commercial farming. And there's a whole new uh, paradigm out there of farming that we just call regenerative farming where a lot of these and organic farmers are doing where they don't till the soil, they kind of layer it with like compost stuff or the other things and they, because the nutrients in the soil, they regenerate the nutrients uh, during the winter and stuff. But that is a problem. You have depleted soils, and that's why we try to buy organic as much as possible. Because uh, these, with the, especially with the GMO stuff, the glyphosate's the roundup in our food, basically, the non-organic non food, is a problem. And there's a lot of information out there. If you look through the book, if you go to, there's a group called the Environmental Work Group, EWG. Go to their website. They have a lot of information on staying away from these glyphosates and GMOs, and a lot of uh, in, uh, information about farming, uh, how to regenerate that. And there's a documentary out there called "Need to Grow," where they talk about regenerative farming, where they're really changing the soil, and then you're, get, you're getting the nutrients back you need. So there's a lot of information out there, but uh, so yeah, it, it is a problem. The soil is, is depleted. Yes, Carol, and Mona, yeah, thank you, Mona. Game Changers is a great uh, resource for that. Thank you, for, okay. Okay, what else we got? We use, okay, we use vegetable broth, yeah, can we use, yeah, we use vegetable, if you go to our cooking class, some of our cooking classes, Kelly, we use, we use vegetable broth, we try to keep it low sodium or no sodium vegetable broth if possible, mm -hmm. but vegetable broth is a good substitute for the oil and water we use to saute and stuff. So yeah, that's a good question. Okay, any other questions? I can, like I say, you can, I'll put some um, my contact, you can see me on the meetup group and we, all my, a lot of my information is there, but I'll just post this. If you want to contact me, be feel free to my email, my YouTube channels out there. I'll post this video out there next day or two. 
So you can revisit it if you need to, to you know, because like I can say there's a lot of information. It can be overwhelming. So uh, appreciate your time. Any, like I say, I'm available. Just e email me for any other questions. I'd be glad to answer. And if you want a free 30 minute consultation, we'd be glad to do that too. We can talk about uh, what your nutritional objectives are and what you like to do. So uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate it, everybody. Take care, come to our cooking classes. <laughs> Bye-bye.